Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us at this ACOR lecture. Uh, just a note at the top to everybody that we are recording this lecture. And so if anybody comes in with questions later, uh, please, please do keep that in mind. And in fact, we are live streaming right now through Facebook. Eventually, this lecture will make its way up to our YouTube channel. Um, and so we'll be excited to, to be able to offer that to everybody later as well. Now, before we get started with our feature presentation tonight from Dr. Clark, I just want to share a few items of news uh, related to ACOR in general. For those who don't know me, my name is Pierce Paul Kreisman, and it's truly my pleasure to serve as the director of ACOR. You can see on the screen here, we have our lecture series. Of course, all of our lectures right now are going to be online and basically in this kind of, uh, kind of forum and capacity. Our next lecture will be on February 16th, then one on March 16th, and then one April 20th that will be delivered in Arabic with some translation support. So we hope you'll join us for those in the future as well. Thank you again for joining us here this evening. Uh, a couple of items of news and notes. Uh, we've had, since our last lecture, we've had several new published materials and I wanna make everybody aware of those published online through our webpage. You can go to this at the address at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we've had a new booklet, a new book, uh, the next issue of Archaeology in Jordan, which has 53 reports about all of the works all over Jordan from 2018 and 19. It's really some remarkable things and news about the archaeology that's happening in the country. We're very excited to bring all of these things to you, and we have a, a great number of articles uh, in our Insights uh, program, uh, photo essay about Petra uh, from the renowned photographer and author Jane Taylor. Uh, and we have started a new series called Ask a Scholar. So we're excited to share all of these things and bring all of these things to you. You can find them through our webpage. Uh, as I mentioned, this lecture will go up on our YouTube channel, but our YouTube channel is another resource that we're pleased to make available to everyone. And we've expanded its content considerably the last several months. Uh, as you may know, the fall is time for many of the conferences for the scholars in our field to gather and present uh, their most current findings. The three major conferences this past fall since our last, uh, since our last lecture and gathering together, ASOR, Mila, and MESA, we're very fortunate to have brought some of that content to, our, to the ACOR uh, YouTube page and to link through to other publicly available content from those, uh, from those conferences. And so we hope that you'll go and find those on our YouTube channel. If you want to keep up to date on all of these things, of course, the best way to do it is to subscribe and you receive the latest notifications on updates. Now, one final bit of news, just to remind everybody that fellowship applications are live and they are due February 1st. We encourage you all to check out uh, our fellowships page on the web page and look through and see if there's something, have you have projects in mind that you'd like to, to pursue. We'd really like to hear from you and, and, and see, some, see some, some new and interesting projects and support you as best we can. So please don't hesitate to look that up. Uh, we also note that on our YouTube uh, page, we now have a tutorial in Arabic that is a step-by-step -step, uh, step -step guide on how to do the applications for anybody who might want a little bit of extra support in doing so. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker this evening, Dr. Douglas Clark, the director of the Center for Near Eastern Archaeology at La Sierra University, who earned his doctorate from Vanderbilt University and previously served as a professor of Old Testament and archaeology, a dean, and a gaggle of other things that if we just lent, mentioned all the things he did, we'd never get to the lecture. And if my research is correct, Doug, you've been conducting fieldwork and excavating in Jordan since 1973. Correct. So, co-director of MRAMP, Dr. Clark, please take us away for the evening. Thank you, uh, Pierce Paul, for that fine introduction. Um, it is a, a distinct privilege and pleasure of mine and of my co-directors they will be appearing later in the program. I'll spend about 35 minutes in the presentation. They will each have something to say after that. You'll see them. And then we will open it up for Q&A. I want to say how much of a privilege and an honor it is to be part of a community of stakeholders, a community of partners who are committed to preserving the past in Jordan, preserving the cultural heritage of the Kingdom of Jordan.
and to providing for financial security with, um, the, the, with cultural heritage, developing cultural heritage so that tourism can increase. That's a present concern. And all of this to ensure a sustainable future for cultural heritage. So it is just a privilege to be part of that. A couple of notes before we begin. Uh, I am in C2 at the Center for Near Eastern Archaeology at La Sierra University in Riverside, California, seated next to one of my best friends who is uh, one of about 70 of these large storage jars called collared pithoi um, that were excavated at Tel from uh, actually from one building. Um, and this one is, as I say, representative of a host of them. It comes from the late Late Bronze Age slash early, early Iron Age, so around 1200 BC, and has been a longtime friend and a great indicator of life and life ways in the past. Uh, I also need to add one note about, um, oh, by way of disclaimer, actually. We have been working with this community of partners, and we'll show you something about that in a slide coming up. But we have been working for years now on this project, and some of us for decades in the country of Jordan. And we will, you will see some things that we've accomplished that we've been able to do uh, th through these partnerships. But we also have dreams, and we're fairly bold when it comes to dreaming dreams. And many of these will need to be reviewed and will need to be approved. So especially when we come toward the end of the presentation, we're thinking about the future, we're thinking about where we would like to go. Remember that this is not the final word. We are so pleased to work with partners who can help us secure something that will be meaningful in the context of Jordan in the future. Uh, what I'd like to do is share this slide with several logos. Actually, these are our partners, but there are more that belong here. I just thought of one um, last evening of another um, partner that should be on this list. Uh, it will continue to grow. It includes a number of universities. You can see the uh, universities of the co-directors and the Department of Antiquities. Um, there are several players from Italy, from uh, Jordan, from the U.S. Um, down on the and in the center of the second row from the bottom is MIMAR, the institute that is the Madaba Institute for Mosaic Art and Restoration. They have been great partners. We meet there for most of our workshops and training sessions. And then uh, on the bottom, the supporting staff of USAID, of ACOR, and SHEP, Sustainable Cultural Heritage Through Engagement of Local Communities Project, along with the US Embassy and the Department of State and outlets that they have in the country. So just a short uh, look here, and we will be moving fairly quickly through these slides, so buckle your seat belts. But um, I do want to pause and thank a number of entities. Some of these are governmental, some of them are institutional. You'll notice the very first one, which gave us a start, was the Harris Grant from ASOR, the American Society um, of Overseas Research is the new name. Then you'll see a, a couple from USAID, ACOR, SHEP, the Ambassador's Grant, Italian outlets, um, MAIC, um, uh, and then Cesar, there's another one that is from, uh, from Italy. So there are a number of, um, of resources that have been made available to us through those partners. Here are the three, four, <laughs> I'll count right. Here are the four co-directors, um, Andrea Falquero, uh, Marta D'Andrea, Suzanne Richard, and myself. And in this next image, the left upper picture, um, Basim Mahamid, our in-country uh, coordinator, who is the Director of Museums and Awareness at the Department of Antiquities Office in Amman. You can also see the teams, our small teams from, seven, from 16 and 17, and then a bit larger team from 18. This one includes um, a group of uh, people doing consolidation. You'll see a picture here where my uh, cursor is of Franco Ciorilli, who is um, a, a master uh, restorer and uh, consolidator. 
and he is the one who has erected and has a team working on the, uh, the scaffolding that you see in the back. You'll see another picture of it soon as well. We have set out in MRAP um, on the basis of uh, a strategic plan. The strategic plan is, is built around sustainability, but it's also built around community. The components preserve cultural heritage in whatever ways we can preserve cultural heritage. And there are a lot of them. We could talk about them. Another one is to link what we do and to link cultural heritage to a community's history that is extremely easy to do in Madaba because it is a, an historical site, an archeological site. And the people who live there, many of them are descendants of people who created the, lad, the last layer of archeology. span a link between uh, cultural heritage and the economy so that tourism can be increased and so that job opportunities are enlarged. And then all of this, whether it's culturally, socially, or economically, sustainable. Sustainable into the future based on community engagement. Um, making cultural heritage a public asset so that we own it and so that it's owned locally to protect the past, to ensure something uh, economic for the, for the present and then sustainable in the future. Communities of stakeholders. This is a very brief listing of a long, long list of some of our partners. You'll see that there are different um, categories, different types of communities. Some of them are regional, some of them are national or international. Uh, some of them are professional, religious, educational, and then some of the examples listed on the right. Uh, it is this group, it is this community or these communities of stakeholders that make possible what we do, that make possible bold dreams that make possible bold advances and steps forward, which can make our projects sustainable long into the future. This is the group, these are the people, these are the partners that matter. And I have a, a couple of slides, uh, these will go rapidly, but they do represent the collaboration history. Beginning in 2006, when then Director General of the Department of Antiquities, Dr. Fawaz al uh, asked that we uh, upgrade the facilities, that we train the staff, and that we digitize the records. Well, that led over time to a much bolder dream, um, repurposing the current museum and building a new one in a more central location, as you will see. And then you will see all kinds of things that are happening here. Um, about midway on the page, a little bit below that, uh, Studio Strati, architectural firm in Rome, one of our great partners, been uh, with us from the beginning. Website development with Imagine Technologies in Amman, uh, engagement of university students. That's is one of our, uh, is one of our favorite pieces is working with university students and local elementary and so on. And then we've got some activities of clearing and excavation training courses, workshops, consolidation. In 2019, we formed a memorandum of understanding with the Department of Antiquities. It took a while to put together, but it was the right thing to do and it has been extremely helpful. And we're so appreciative to the department for their help. Um, we have a new map and timeline, you'll see that and uh, inter uh, interpretive signage. Um, a lot of work in the current museum uh, working now with the Ambassadors Fund for Cultural uh, Preservation Protection and the Cultural Antiquities Task Force of the Department of State of the US government. And then some um, workshops, a, an artifact handling one, um, a Pottery of Jordan training workshop. You notice that we have achieved nonprofit status in the US. We have our own 501c3 and donations will go to that. Um, a number of things that we're looking forward to in the future that have been built on what you see here. Uh, I want to call special attention to the advisory council uh, near the bottom. This is a group of people representing the department, representing local tourism, representing local business people, lo representing educational people that uh, is our sounding board for moving ahead. And then finally, we are working with several people, you see them listed there, on a new grant application for um, 
expanding what we're doing with virtual tours and other matters, storytelling and so on, that will be expanded to include the wider region. So I now have uh, six folders. Uh, three of them are on site and three of them are online. We have been divided because of COVID between on site and online. Um, and it's really quite surprising to us that with our good staff, our great staff in Madiba, a lot is still happening on site, even though we're not there. It's, it's a terrific group of people. So on site, first of all, the Archaeological Park West, and you can see it labeled there in the center of the picture. And in the bold rectangle, the site for the new museum, built over ruins from the end of the 19th century. We'll talk more about that when we get there. The important thing here is the Heritage Trail. This trail goes from Visitor Center to St. George's Church and actually a couple of other places in Madiba. Um, and it's right along that trail that hundreds of thousands in a typical year, hundreds of thousands of tourists make their way to these various places. We will be on that trail. And that's one of the reasons it was chosen. Another is that the Department of Antiquities already owned it. So that's helpful. Uh, that's extremely helpful, especially in downtown historic Madiba. Uh, this will be, it's a late 20th century building. It will be the entry hall, the uh, welcome hall for the museum complex. The doors are open here, which is really very rare. The opening used currently is off to the left. To give an idea of um, some progress at any rate, excavations were done here in the 1980s and the 1990s, but abandonment until uh, 2016 left the site looking like this, which is rather discouraging. But after a season or two, we could make it look like this, which uh, was really remarkable to happen. But we had great team, uh, a great team of excavators and uh, people clearing. Uh, this allowed us to transform what was weeds and uh, actually a lot of trees in here too, into the settlement. Uh, I'll say something more about the settlement from the late 19th century. Most of buildings one, two, and then courtyard three, those are from the 1880s. What's on the right side of that line are from a bit later. We're still uh, utilizing those buildings that will be part of the ground floor of the museum. This is a practice that happens in Europe, especially in Italy, where architectural remains, archeological remains are actually protected as the ground floor of new museum buildings. And so in this particular uh, picture, one sees the scaffolding in the middle for the ongoing uh, wall consolidation. An important achievement in this picture, Starling Carter, part of the Shep team and her husband Jawad Hijazi designed this, uh, a great team as they put it together and help, um, helped us think about where we wanted to put things. This map is, well, map and descriptive table is going to be, it is posted, I'll show it a picture in a minute. Uh, in hard copy, it's two meters wide. And you can see here, it's in Arabic and English. It is color coded. Um, it also lists some detail about each site uh, in English and in Arabic. And also the, the kilometer uh, distance, the range away from Madaba, because we want to communicate uh, that this is a regional museum. And we want to make sure that people, when they come to the regional museum, will have instructions on how to get to Ameri, Kirbet Ataruz, Deban, uh, Kirbet Safra, etc. Uh, the next um, part of this, the next component, which will be mounted, is mounted uh, below the map, is this timeline. Eric uh, and English, color coded again. And then on the right hand side, same color coding and names but now you have QR codes. Those QR codes are on the hard copy map and people can come and can drill down in a couple of steps for more information about the sites. And this picture, most of you will have seen for the first time ever because this was mounted, this map that we just uh, talked about and described was mounted, I think about three weeks ago 
maybe four, but uh, recently. And it is right on the entryway so that people coming in from the left will be able to look at that. They can use their smartphones to drill down for more information about these sites and so on. I'm gonna say something more about this when we come to the website development. Another um, folder of on-site um, activity in Madaba. Madaba in general, the first image uh, shows the very first meeting of the MRAP Advisory Council. This is the group with representation from the government, from local tourism, from businesses. Uh, and it is the group that we look to, that is our sounding board. We met once in person in March. Uh, we've met a time or two remotely, but that didn't work too well because I think of bandwidth problems. Um, and so now I send a report every month or every two months. This lecture is the December and January report for the advisory council. Great group of people, extremely enthusiastic, and we'll see where that takes us. Um, businesses, uh, another group of our partners and uh, stakeholders um, throughout Madaba in the historic district. Um, Yusuf Sawalha in the lower right, is one of the descendants of 90 plus Christian families who moved to Madaba from Karak in the 1880s. So he's one of the offspring of uh, basically three tribal groups, but several family entities. And uh, he's, he's extremely interesting to talk to because he has all of this history and he fills us in, tells us the stories that we wouldn't get uh, elsewhere. Another individual who is a part of this, I'll show you in a moment. Um, we are excavating the house of his grandparents uh, on the left, building number two. He lives in the picture on the right where the arrow is in the, through the windows of that apartment. And he is uh, Dr. Ghalib Owemrin, who is a terrific human, brain, human being who, whom you will hear uh, in a moment, uh, as he is one of our storytellers for our virtual tours. Great person, uh, great contributions to what we do, as are so many people in Jordan. In fact, what's exciting about this lecture for me is that although I can't see all of you, I know that so many of my friends are there and I wish I could give a shout out to all of you uh, and to former colleagues as well, um, but we'll have to do that through a different format. Several workshops that have been accomplished over the uh, uh, years of, of MRAP's activity in Madaba, conservation, mosaics, walls. Uh, you'll notice on the lower right, uh, school children visiting, watching this process. Uh, we are totally committed to the fact that training school children to appreciate their cultural heritage is the way, even if it's generational, to get to the place of sustainability for cultural heritage. An artifact photography training course, um, Jillian Logi at the left in the upper picture um, is the instructor from Calgary, uh, Alberta, Canada. Um, again, one of the joys of our lives is working with students. Uh, there is a group of um, architectural students in uh, who became interns for us uh, from the American University of Madaba, which is about four or five kilometers south of Madaba on the desert highway. Terrific students, absolutely top of their class. And they have uh, provided reports that even stunned our architects in Rome. I mean, they're just great people. We've also had students, architecture students from Hashemite University, from the University of Jordan. And so it's been exciting to be part of this student enthusiasm and energy um, as we've put uh, their thoughts and their <clears throat> suggestions into our process. The official launch of this project was on the 17th of May in 2017. About 200 people gathered for this event, which is really quite exciting. 
and uh, involved uh, heads of, uh, well, embassy personnel from the US and Italy and others uh, governmental and regional and uh, uh, local munis municipality. Um, a workshop for local contractors and architects on the left, Jihad Harun, who is the lead for these projects, is uh, making a presentation for them. Great feedback from them and from everybody on these uh, workshops. A recent one, this one in September at Mimar at the Mosaic Institute um, on artifact handling done by uh, Dr. Fatma uh, Mari, who is at the right in the picture on the right. And she is the main instructor, uh, Tamara DC. Also um, the computer shows Suzanne Richard and me providing a taped welcome. We couldn't quite get the bandwidth to work. So we taped it in advance and sent it that way. Um, we have also, um, well, here we see their, um, the, the graduates with their certificates and we see them at work in the, what has been an artifact display room, but has rapidly, is rapidly changing into a storage facility. These display cases have now been moved out and we'll watch what happens to those. The outcome of this particular workshop is a, a manual on what to do with uh, artifacts, how to handle, how to pack, how to transport, how to store them. An English version, these are 50 pages long each, and an Arabic version. They will show up online, but they will also show up uh, on a spiral bound uh, laminated paper, um, basically like a lab manual for use in Jordanian um, archeology span museums by Jordanian archeology span students and others. So we think that's a great contribution that uh, Dr. Fatma and Tamara and Lillian, the artist, uh, made for us in that project. Another um, workshop, a dream of uh, Jihad Harun and myself, a Pottery of Jordan workshop, which will also work into a manual, as you'll see in a minute. Pottery is so important for archaeologists, for any of us to understand the past, to understand lifeways, to understand commerce, to understand trade, to understand chronology. Pottery is the bread and butter of dirt archaeologists. And so we've got millions and millions and millions of these broken potsherds, which can help us actually refine things quite well um, when we're trying to study them to learn from them. Uh, here is a, um, an outline of uh, the beginnings of the table of contents. This is virtually done. We have one more coming in. I received the second to the last chapter last evening. And then we've got one more that's coming in. Um, you'll notice that we do some background material here. And then uh, we come down in part two to the various um, time periods in Jordan. And we're learning about the forms in each of those time periods. And you'll notice the, um, the authors through here. These are the experts in these time periods. I should mention that number 12, chapter 12, the Hellenistic period, Adib Abu Shmes was the person conducting that um, table talk about pottery pieces in the photo we saw earlier. Uh, this also will come out with online and hard copy versions, also in English and Arabic. And hopefully by the end of the month, maybe the beginning of the next month, we will have these ready for the press. On site, one more thing about the current museum. Um, it is located, as you can see in the lower part of the uh, image here. Um, and it's about a five to seven minute walk from the Madaba Archaeological Park West. Um, there are several buildings uh, in, the, um, in the enclosure, the entry on the left, and then further into the museum on the right. It is this floor plan, however, that indicates what we hope to do. Uh, ultimately, our goal is to make storage and research possible at this facility, which will then support the new museum. Um, in the interim, however, uh, in this next slide, there will be some display areas in rooms one and four. Uh, storeroom two and storeroom three are currently being uh, finished inside and we'll be putting shelving and so on in soon. Uh, and then the textile storeroom 
on the, on the right-hand side. So a lot of activity going on here. In fact, rooms one and four are virtually done and are ready for the artifacts to be installed. This is what storage at the Madava storage unit, very small, extremely inadequate, looked like before and sort of after. We're moving toward a, um, a kind of a better after, but given our space limitations, this is what our staff has been doing. Um, also some construction pictures here of um, electrical um, changes, some of the construction changes here on this wall niche. Um, air conditioning, heating units in every one of these rooms that will be mounted fairly soon. And then those of you who haven't been there for months will not recognize these pictures because these represent now the new display rooms, which ultimately will then come back into storage space. The floors, which obviously had accumulated decades of, uh, of dirt from hundreds of visitors, are now polished back to their original, um, well, we think it's their original state. Um, storage is going to happen, we hope, with uh, shelving like this. And um, this is currently in the Citadel Museum or the Jordan Archaeological Museum uh, in downtown Amman. Uh, we're learning from them how to do this, and I'll say something more about that in a minute. And then this is how we plan to lay out the storage units in the storerooms. Uh, for the repurposing. This is our team of curators, Amal on the right, and then Suha and Najwa, uh, our MRAMP employees and have been since the beginning of MRAMP. Outside, some of you will remember going down these treacherous stairs without a guardrail, a handrail. Uh, now they are all evenly spaced in height and a protective uh, handrail as well. This is a new project. It's actually been underway for three or four years uh, in the German Protestant Institute of Archaeology, which is not far from ACOR. Dr. Jutta um, Husser is the point person, and she's the one that you'll see in this image, who is um, working with Suzanne Richard and me. In, um, we, we've been in conversation as she has developed an incredibly helpful online database for keeping track of artifacts in the museums. And that's what it's for, and we will be benefiting from all of that work uh, soon. On the left-hand side, before and after, moving from top to bottom. Right-hand side, moving um, from the top to bottom, before <laughs> hand records to this new uh, digital uh, database. And we will be, as I say, being part of that. Um, the virtual museum, um, I'm going to show a slide here briefly or a um, short video. Some of you have seen it and we'll make sure the sound is up. It's about two minutes.
And our gratitude to Studio Strati and especially to Sam Ababna, who is the graphics artist here. They are now working on a longer one, um, which will be more detailed. Um, and so, and then a, a couple of um, plans. These have not uh, been discussed beyond just the uh, co-directors and the uh, architect. So these are, um, um, how do you say, aspirational. They are, we're hoping, we're moving in this direction. But there are some features that really, I think are going to be interesting and helpful from these isometric views. This is in situ, this is where the, uh, the, the block is and the community that lives around us. So this will be definitely embedded in a local urban setting. Ground floor cafe and gift shop, uh, nicely designed here. Again, this is how we're thinking. This is where we're aiming. Some possibilities for exhibition space. This one I like really a lot for a children's education lab. We're looking forward to that possibility too. Virtual tours, something that has come about in the last several months, developed especially through December and into January by this group. It involves three groups of people. Uh, that is, it involves three local groups of people. Uh, there are three individuals from the American University of Madaba, one of our partners, who are doing data capture. There are three tour guides and there are six storytellers. And we won't spend long on this, but you will see in the picture on the right, also drone activity, drone recording. Those are spectacular photos uh, using the drone photogrammetry along with uh, ground level photogrammetry. This is what they use in their training. Uh, fairly sophisticated, but this has all been done online from SciArc um, in the States to our team in Madaba. And there is our team in the middle, in the lower part, Hannah and Saif uh, from the uh, faculty at American University of Madaba and Jude, who is a student there. And they are all busy at work doing photogrammetry uh, and recording thousands and thousands of photos. Here, our, here are our tour guides. I'm going to give you um, one brief and now part. let's go inside the St. George Church to really see what makes this church special and unique. Once we enter inside the church, just to our right on the floor, we can see a remarkable mosaic. It's a beautiful mosaic flooring that is considered as a document and not just a piece of art. It is the map that have guided the pilgrims coming to the Holy Land from all over the Christian world during the Byzantine and Umayyad period. These are our storytellers. One picture is missing, Abu Charlie uh, Twal. Uh, we adore Abu Charlie and uh, we're not able to get a photo soon enough. Uh, I want you to listen now to Ghalib Owemrin, who is one of our storytellers as he tells part of his. My name is Ghalib Oweimri. I was born on the site of the Bird Palace in Madaba, Jordan. We lived in a couple of simple one-room houses built of clay and medium-sized stones. The area held our small clan of two brothers, their wives, ten children, and our sheep goats, cows, and the horse. Around the buildings, the ground was, and still is, covered with colored mosaics. So, some great stories to be heard. All of these will be interwoven into the uh, online virtual tours. And then one more stop, the uh, website. Uh, this is under development. I'm going to leave actually the, uh, the, the place and I'm gonna to go to show what we are. I'm saying under development because maybe that's because it always will be. Uh, let me see where my, huh, where my museum went. Aha, uh -huh. give me a moment, sorry about this, apologies. Not sure why that isn't showing up. Okay, give me just a second. I will have this momentarily. 
Uh, okay. Maybe I am there. I am, this is live. <laughs> it did get there. Great, uh, technology always surprises us. This is the new website. And as you will hear in a minute, uh, it is going live. In fact, it is live. In fact, with this lecture, we, we inaugurate it. We launch the website and you can go on. In fact, we invite you to do so in either the English or the Arabic version. Whoops, that skipped out. Doug, can I convince you to try and share it again? You know, I think that got out of place. Sorry about that. I think you're exactly right, thanks. Here we go. Is that better? Excellent, thank you, Excellent. sir. Thank you for catching that, so sorry. Um, in any case, uh, this will be in uh, English, as you see here, and one can scoot over to the Arabic version. We won't take time to do it here, but you can. Um, our major partners are listed in the logos below. And then there are lots of possibilities on the website. Um, you can see as in these drop down menus, one can find out all kinds of things about the project, about the museum. One can do go to initiatives, exhibitions, various media outlets. Oh, the donate button, there's a donate button. One can see that as well and please use it as you can. Um, but I wanted just to give one picture of the, the Madaba regional map and timeline because this is the online version of what you've seen before. So here are key sites and you'll notice in the map that comes up, this is the same as you saw before, but it also has below it the timeline and all of these do. Uh, and also the indicators again, color coded of the names, but you can do more with this thing. You can decide that you want to see only the late Bronze Age sites and only the late Bronze Age sites are here. You can go to them, you can click on here, get some basic information. You can read more by going here and then you can actually go to websites of the various projects. So in the process, one is able to see uh, a lot about the archeology span of the region through the website. We're so grateful to imagine technologies. And we're so grateful that we can now share it and announce that it is, uh, it is live. So let me come right back to the uh, PowerPoint for just a moment and end with uh, some objectives. And I'll do this very quickly. There are some on-site objectives and some online objectives. We're kind of staying with that bifurcation with those two sides to our work. So fundraising, uh, a lot that we'll be doing that is technical work, uh, some more consolidation. We're developing narrative storylines. Um, travel permitting, we'll be doing more work at the current museum. A lot of renovation through uh, Italian support uh, of the introductory hall and the Burnt Palace and um, other components of the Archaeological Park West. And then online continued development, we're hoping to do much, much more uh, with a virtual museum that is in our plans and our work and children's activities and so on. We're bold, we, we want to think bold thoughts about where we want to go in the future, ultimately ending up with a real, act, where, with, with a real concrete museum in place. So with this information, I think we need to switch Jackie to our co-directors and bring them on for comments that they'd like to make. You'll need to unmute yourself. Thank you. <laughs> I think we've got people joining us just now. Uh, if Bassem is with us and wants to raise his hand, feel free to, but I'm not seeing his name currently. Okay. And I think we're going to begin with Suzanne. I'm going to stop sharing so that we can see people better. Okay. So, um, well, I think Doug covered the two ambassador grant projects very well indeed. And I simply want to underscore what has been accomplished remotely. Um, the four month digital mapping of Madaba is virtually complete, no pun intended. 
we await Cyarc to complete the integration of the audio with the massive photogrammetry drone data to produce 3D models and virtual tours of these wonderful heritage sites. The videos will then be published on the SciArc platform, as well as on our website and freely accessible very soon. Likewise, the storage facility project, I believe, is an amazing success story. Since despite our absence uh, from the field, the facility is almost ready for the next stage of the project once the shelving and HVAC equipment is installed. So that new stage focuses on the artifactual collection which really will be the signature source for exhibits in the new museum. Uh, the collection must be properly labeled and organized in the storerooms, as well as assessed for remedial conservation. I do hope that Doug and I can be in Jordan this summer to oversee this phase, but if not, on the basis of what's been accomplished remotely, I am not too worried. <laughs> and finally, just to reiterate what Doug has been saying all along throughout this lecture, the purpose of both projects was and is to preserve and safeguard the heritage of Jordan. One through a virtual record of heritage sites, the other through the protection of some 14,000 artifacts from thousands of years of antiquity in the Madaba region. The new repository, storage center, conservation lab, study center will all support the new museum, which is the founding purpose of MRAM after all. Thank you. I think Andrea is going next. Thank you, Doug. Thank you to give me the opportunity just to spend a very few words about the Italian effort in the MRAM project. I want just to say that um, my university, Perugia University, and the Sapienza University with my colleagues Mark and Andrea participate very actively. And uh, we want to thank in particular also the Italian uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs for uh, its um, support in uh, the last few years uh, from 20, uh, 2018 to 2020. In particular, uh, his support that permit us uh, to, uh, to bring with us in Jordan uh, Italian uh, students and specialists uh, about um, archaeology and also to give us, this, us the opportunity and support uh, to accomplish to some um, uh, few target uh, inside the archaeological uh, park west that uh, already mentioned by uh, Douglas uh, before. Uh, I want also briefly just um, to tell you that uh, the Italian uh, works in Madaba will, uh, uh, will be strengthened by the presence of another project founded by the Italian Agency for Development Cooperation, the AIX, that will regard uh, uh, several activities inside Madaba, but uh, um, that will uh, uh, participate and cooperate also with MRAMP inside the Archaeological Park West, in particular concerning activities of uh, restoration of the Bar Palace and uh, activities inside the old clinic. So thank you again, Doug, to give me this uh, opportunity and for your lecture. And Marta. Thank you. Thank you, Doug, and, uh, and all the colleagues. And I only want to add a few words on the vision of the future Madaba Regional Archaeological Museum. Um, that may complement what you already have uh, illustrated in terms of architectural concepts and particularly as concerns the exhibit. Um, obviously, um, all proposals will uh, be subject to approval by local uh, cultural authorities in Jordan, but uh, we, are, um, uh, we are working on a proposal for some sort of different uh, approach uh, to the museum. Uh, a thematic approach that might interest visitors. And so we are imagining um, a narrative approach that uh, might build on a timeline and chronological presentation of the artifacts in a dedicated space of the museum, but that may then develop thematically by level uh, around um, narrative lines that might, um, uh, might connect to, let's say, global themes. Uh, and uh, therefore we are in the process of preparing a tentative list of potential storylines to submit to and discuss with 
uh, Jordanian uh, cultural authorities, but in keeping with uh, the inclusive nature of the project, we would also like to have the members of the advisory board as part mm -hmm. of this conversation, because as you have already uh, so much well shown, they uh, really represent the broad range of the project's uh, stakeholders in the local community and the variety of uh, the Madaba region's community and voices. And um, concluding, I only want to stress that the importance of, the, of an operation as such at this stage of the project might be twofold. In fact, on the one hand, this might be a way to move forward the planning operations by um, discussing these ideas and the feasibility with the architectural team of the Studio Strati. But on the other, it might also be a way to forge a connection, a strong connection starting from now between the future museum and the regional sites and among the regional mm -hmm. sites by means of global themes that transcend uh, space and time. And so thank you for giving me the opportunity to touch upon this. Thank you, Marta. Um, I think maybe we go back to, uh, to you, uh, Pierce Paul, for Q&A, if we're ready for that. Yes, thank you all first and foremost for this presentation, Doug. We're, we're, we're grateful for your time and all of the, the, the co-directors, thank you for making yourselves available. I know we're stretched all across the world right now and uh, I'm just, I'm grateful for technology making this all possible, even though it frustrates us at times. Um, and on that note, I would actually like to start with a personal question because Andrea, I missed part of it due to, to some skipping. Could you talk a little bit more about the, the new, the additional project? Uh, I didn't catch that entirely, and I want to make sure that everybody else did. Perhaps everybody else did, and it's my connection. So. Maybe Suzanne should speak to that. Well, I, uh, I think they're talking about the well, Ike's sorry. project. Uh, oh. The, 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 the Italian or the um, State Department? Well, start with the Italian one because Andrea mentioned it and it, and I think it skipped a little and maybe it was just my connection, but then I'd like to learn. That's also a question that we have is more about the state one. Sorry, exactly. thank you, Andrea. Yeah. First, of, first of all, thank you. Thank you, no, just a few, uh, one minute. Uh, first of all, uh, um, it uh, is a project, is a new project that started uh, now in uh, the end of 2020. Um, so it will be, more active on the field in the future years. Um, it regards uh, restoration and uh, reopening of some uh, archaeological uh, areas uh, inside the city of Madaba in order to, 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 um, to open a new trail, touristic trail uh, for the city. Of course, uh, the project uh, inside these uh, several areas will work also in the archaeological park west. And here we will do uh, with Ike some uh, um, activities uh, also uh, concerning uh, the restoration of the mosaics of the Bar Palace, uh, but uh, moreover, it is important for the for the uh, cooperation with the Man Lamp project uh, the uh, rehabilitation of the old cleaning, and that uh, is uh, we 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 um, uh, we. Th I, I think we're losing a bit of contact uh, there. So, so let, let me just summarize a couple things that I think I heard Andrea say. Um, the, the, the Italian project will refurbish the entry hall right on the Heritage Trail. Also the old clinic, that's early 20th century, the old clinic, which is early 20th century, that will be turned into an introductory hall and timeline. And then also the mosaics, uh, continued restoration of mosaics. Those are the primary, oh, and then um, repurposing or changing of the coverings over the burnt palace. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure we got that in there. But now I'll ask Suzanne the same question about the next Thanks. about the state project. Right. Um, well, what specifically, I, you know, uh, the two projects, we have the two, Doug and I are co-PIs. Uh, the first project, well, we got the grant in September 2019, and actually it will be drawing to a close 
uh, this year, 2021 in September, and that's the repurposing of the museum, the current museum at the DOA, making it a state-of-the-art storage facility, research center, and so forth. Um, so a lot of that infrastructure work has gone on in our absence, but the next stage is the important one about you know putting the collection uh, into the storage facility and so forth. So we're hoping to get that done. The second project, which was amazing, uh, that we um, you know were in discussions with the State Department, they even suggested it to us since we couldn't get to Jordan, and they said, well, maybe you could do something digitally, you know, or uh, you know, three D. Um, virtual reality. So uh, after many collaborations, uh, we came up with the project, the MABA um, Digital Documentation and Tourism Project. And, and that started really September, really uh, got, got uh, going uh, November, December. And it's, it is about finished and is being put together by SciArc. And if uh, people don't know SciArc, they should go to their website to see all the fantastic things they do. But really, uh, I think it'll be a fantastic way for people to learn about Jordan's heritage uh, in the absence of being able to actually visit there, but then encourage tourism in the future too. Thank you. Thank you for, for that, that additional information about the project. So we've got some other questions coming in here, uh, and I want to make sure we take them as basically as best we can. Uh, Doug, early on, there was a question about volunteer opportunities, and now there's a question about if and how you can involve students from the local universities in your project. Right. We, um, we'll, we're, we're intending uh, at least one more, what we would call a small field se uh, season. And that does involve university students locally. We've, we've typically tried to do that. We also have uh, different projects, even like what Suzanne was talking about, in which we involved Jude Twal from uh, the uh, American University of Madaba. So we do this in several, uh, in several different ways. We are absolutely enamored with the quality of work that these students bring to our, our, our shared project. Uh, and in the process, we want to learn from them. We hope they learn from us and that we do this jointly. They will own it better. And so that's important. We, we have other academic communities in the region, German Jordan University, we've been in conversation with them, even King's Academy, uh, they have been open to archeological kinds of things. We want to establish more with them. Um, and so our goal is to encourage student participation and we will have volunteer opportunities. We would like to say this year, this is all COVID dependent, but we would like to say this year sometime that we would have another season. Uh, that's dependent on a couple of other pieces in play too, but hopefully so. Thank you. Uh, there's a number of folks writing in saying congratulations. Of course, they're, they're very excited. They're grateful for the work you're doing in the area. We have a number of people on uh, today who are from the area thanking you for the work you're doing and the way you're engaging the people there. So I want to make sure that you all are, are, are hearing this feedback as well. We've got another note from Juta, who's saying to the whole team, great project. Mm -hmm. uh, and she'd like to announce that the DOJAM project will be extended for two more years until February of 2023 and is very much looking forward to continuing cooperation. Uh, so that's exciting, an exciting announcement here. It's, it's uh, very exciting. If I can make a comment, um, Trish Paul. Uh, Utah has been one of our really lively partners in all of this. And uh, I decided I should not announce what she did. She needs to announce it, and she did, <laughs> that this has been extended. And that's terrific because it means that the work that she has done and her team has done with the Citadel Museum, what we've always called the Citadel Museum, um, the Jordan Archaeological Museum, uh, what the work that she has done for them and for their records, for their, uh, the digitization of their artifactual records, that now will become applicable to the Madaba Museum. I've, I've, I've told her that we want to be at the top of the list. Uh, when that, so that, that's why that extension is so helpful and meaningful to me, because it means we might even get on the list. It'd be great. Wonderful. Uh, so we have a couple more questions coming in. Marta, there's a question. What are the four themes that are being considered? You mentioned four themes. 
maybe Doug, you, you might have some insights on this too. No, I didn't mention the number of teams. I'm just saying that I just said that I'm, we are working on teams. And like, for example, just, just to, throw, to throw in one is a um, food systems through time might be like a team that might connect uh, sites that are occupied in different time periods uh, within the region in a, in a way that makes sense, uh, both chronologically and... And I, and I think that Marta said that the timeline, I mean, any museum needs to have a timeline. One has to know how to move through the chronology of the period. That will, of the periods in the country, that will happen in the timeline building, in the old clinic building. So there will be a total immersive um, chronological uh, experience there. So then we thought that um, for the museum itself, why repeat that? And why not do something suggested by one of our colleagues um, from in, in this new NEH proposal? I've learned a lot from Sten LaBianca and what he has done with anthropology. And he's suggesting global history, not the typical chronological history, but global history themes, which tie us not only to the past in unique ways with these themes, but these are themes that matter for the present. For instance, water. What about water? We have we've lots of indications of how water is used in the past. And water is one of the basic essentials in modern Jordan. Jordan, I think, is the, fo is the fourth most water poor country in the world. Water matters. Um, we're thinking about uh, some themes um, like daily life, uh, like religious life. We're thinking about um, uh, disruption and resilience as a theme. And that could be developed in different sorts of ways. So in any case, those, what, those are what we're pondering now. And we actually have um, a, a kind of an initial listing and we'll be running this by our advisory council and the Department of Antiquities and others in the coming weeks. Thank you. Okay, so we've got a question coming in uh, from Katrina on Facebook. Uh, what's going to happen to the heritage collection at the old uh, museum at the old museum of the Twal House? Suzanne, do you want to say something about that? Well, if you're talking about the house with the mosaics, um, that remains. Um, and well, as Doug was saying, it's kind of complicated, but um, whereas originally we were going to have four rooms uh, that served for storage and workspace, uh, we needed to use two of the rooms for an interim museum. So, um, but that will hopefully be resolved when, you know, the Italians finish their work uh, in the clinic and we can put materials there. As for the collect the mosaics, we have already, and Doug, I don't know, he, he, he was kind of showing this, but you probably didn't notice, there are doors, new doors, and, and, and the entrance has changed so that people can still come to the DOA and get into those 12 uh, heritage sites. So right. they are still there. That's right. And we also want to make sure people are aware that we want to keep the Folklore Museum alive and well. It will be on display through this interim and then hopefully somehow tied to the ground floor of the new museum where the traditional settlement is, is located. So yes, we uh, are anxious to preserve all of those, uh, including, especially including the Twal houses and the mosaics that they cover. Wonderful, thank you. There are more kudos and congratulations coming in and I'll make sure to forward those to you uh, afterward. I'm going to take a selfish question and ask a little bit more about the pottery manual. Uh, can you speak more at length about this? Because there are just never enough pottery manuals and there's all, we always need more pictures and more work on these. Can you tell a little bit more about that? Yes, you know, if we had Jihad Harun on this, I mean, he's the guy who for years, it's just been his, his life's passion to come with something that is useful within the context of Jordanian pottery. There are lots of good pottery volumes out there, um, but none adapted like we think this one will be for Jordanian pottery. 
Um, and, and this will consist of these chapters, you saw them listed there, introduced by background material, including uh, sourcing of clay, including typology in general, uh, including the economy of ceramics. Uh, Andre is doing that chapter, has done it. Um, and then the periods, all of these will have illustrations. Uh, we actually are planning to be fairly limited in the use of illustrations in the hard copy. Uh, we, we may change our minds on that because they are so helpful. I think I heard you say that, uh, Pierce Paul, that that is really what you want. You wanna look at something that will illustrate what you've just found in the museum and help you uh, identify it and locate it chronologically. So um, the, the plan, at least initially, has been to expand the possibilities for the online version be the same chapters, um, perhaps expanded there, but more images. So we definitely want these to be, again, in English and in Arabic, uh, we want them to be useful in a lab context where people need answers to their questions. That's why we want it. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, and since I have it on good authority that ACOR is going to be uh, uh, publishing this, I would strongly encourage you to put more images in, okay. more <laughs> figures. Noted, noted. For those of us who just aren't the experts, it makes life so much better. Uh, uh, and we have uh, one more question it looks like, and I think we might wrap it up after that. Uh, there's, there, there's a question about the visitor capacity. Uh, do you have an idea what the total visitor capacity might be to the area so that it enables it to not damage the, the sites by overuse essentially? I don't know, Marta or Andrea, you are in closer touch with the architects, might be able to respond to that. Let me just make one quick comment that we, uh, we work very hard to protect what is exposed uh, in the park, the second century Roman roadway, the sixth century AD uh, Martyr's Church and Burnt Palace, um, and then the later remains from the late uh, 19th century. So we, we, we try to barricade people off from getting into some of those, uh, but the capacity of the museum itself, do we know anything, uh, Marta, any suggestions? Uh, yes, um, I mean, I, I think that the, the important point that you stress is that we are aware of the need to keep track and regulate the flow of tourists within uh, protected antiquities. I, I guess that we were we will get to to this kind of estimate once we have decided which the the thematic uh, uh, the, the narrative lines will be because we have an accurate estimate of the size for each floor. But of course, developing the exhibit uh, will will tell us how many showcases, which places, and and this of course will will impact on the final figure of uh potential visitors uh at once let's say so i, I think this is a, this will come after the discussion about the exhibit is over let, let me uh, add just one quick postscript to that uh, the museum is being designed and its entrances so that the main access is through the routes that we've suggested you've seen it in the video but another access route even when the park is closed if people want to use the auditorium uh, which can be reconfigured into small meeting rooms uh, or the terrace. Uh, one can use parts of the museum coming in after hours through an opening that of course will have a guard there, but in any case, will make the facility useful for other cultural activities. So then one can think about capacity, how many can fit on that uh, open terrace and so on. So, and then of course the um, coffee shop and the, uh, um, or and, the, and the restaurant, those will matter in different ways too. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we've got a couple of hands up and I'm encouraging folks to submit their questions, but we don't yet have them. Uh, are the, for the panelists, is there anybody who'd like to add anything else before we, before we point it towards wrapping up for the evening? Evening for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I wanna thank you all. If, if, there's, if there's nothing else, we are exceedingly grateful for everyone attending. Uh, we're very grateful uh, to, to all four of you for being here with us tonight. Doug, especially, thank you so much. 
Um, and to all of your colleagues, we know there are a great number of them who weren't able to, to join us and talk back and forth tonight, but we want to acknowledge them again with a great thanks for the work y'all are doing uh, down in the region and, and uh, the, the long-term vision you're really trying to bring to all of this. It's fantastic that the facilities are going to be available outside of what might be normal archaeology hours. Uh, it makes those, those buildings that much more valuable to the people and community who truly live, in, live there and, and make that space their home. Uh, so again, I just want to say thank you to everybody. I will give the round of applause. I know everybody online is clapping at the same time. Uh, but thank you all very much for tonight. Uh, and we hope to see uh, everyone again soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. See you.